little background. We got a farm uh, just outside of Plain City. I farm with my son, Josh. We got a uh, business called Yoder Ag Services where we sell a lot of seed and precision planter parts and a lot of cover crop seed as well as uh, uh, foliar feeding and things like that. We're constantly trying to find things that are going to be uh, helpful to, to agriculture. Um, as Randall mentioned, I served as president of the National Corn Growers. But after that, I got involved with a group called 25 by 25, which uh, Bill Richards was uh, on the board as well. And that was the group that uh, sought to find ways to that we could use 25% uh, of our, our uh, energy comes from renewable sources by 2025. We're not quite there yet. I think we're like 18%, but uh, we're, we're on our way. So we're, we're doing that. And that, that sort of led us to uh, start a nonprofit called Solutions from the Land. And one of the things that is unique about solutions from the land is the fact that uh, we think solutions should come from the land and not everything bad. Uh, farmers have kind of taken a, a bad rap about some things. You know, we got H2 Ohio, we got some water quality issues, we got some other things going on. And, um, and, and so we have to figure out ways that we can make people understand that we have solutions, not just, not just bad things. So solutions from the land, um, a little bit about it. So it's a farmer-led 501c3 nonprofit. Um, it's about land-based solutions to global challenges. One of the reasons we started going to the uh, the climate talks, the COP meetings uh, in various places all over the world, is because they weren't including agriculture, and yet they they blamed agriculture for a, a significant part of, of global climate change, and we didn't think that that was fair. And so uh, these meetings I go to, uh, there's no farmers there except me and a couple others that come with us. Um, but our focus is, is a system. It's all about production of food, feed, fiber, clean energy, and ecosystem services. So it's, it's all of the above and not just one single thing. Um, the th some of the groups that uh, we end up uh, being with is uh, globally we work with uh, the UNFCCCC, and that stands for United Nations Foundation Convention on Climate Change. That's basically the, 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 the COP meetings and stuff like that. And, and then uh, out under that, there's a group called the Cornivia Work Group, which is strictly agriculture. And for the first time in Madrid last December, which was supposed to be in Chile, that got canceled. But it was in, uh, we had uh, our first real bona fide meeting. And uh, one of the things that was really striking to me is uh, we were in a big room. I think there was 160 nations that were sitting uh, in the room. and. Uh, they went around the, the table and they were, they were talking about all the things that were wrong with agriculture. And I've wondered how many times I heard the first thing we have to accept is that agriculture is broken and we need to reinvent agriculture. And we also needed to uh, figure out ways to get away from, from uh, protein uh, based from animal uh, consumption rather than, than plant consumption. So uh, there's, a, there's a real effort there to uh, negate all the good things that, that the animal uh, industry is, is trying to do. Uh, FAO, that's uh, Foreign Agriculture Organization, that is the group that's in Rome and uh, Kip Tom, a farmer from uh, Indiana, is uh, the ambassador to FAO from the United States and we're working really strong and hard with him because he's frustrated too because the rest of the world, they look at, uh, at uh, technology with disdain. We, we got to get rid of all this technology. We got to go back to raising crops like we did, you know, 60, 70 years ago, because that's more sustainable. I'm not, I'm not sure where they're getting that. And the, the problem is we have no one there to, to really say that, except, except we're there. These people are not farmers, but they knew how we should be farming. And so it's really important that we, we tell our message Western agriculture is not looked on favorably. They look at it, you hear words like uh, regenerative agriculture or agroecological, and that uh, basically organic production is the only way to go. And, and if you, it, it depends on what you're trying to sustain, that word sustainable. It's really, it's really a hard one. If you think about sustaining uh, uh, and sequestering carbon, if you, if you have to till uh, for uh, weed control, then you're releasing carbon every time you, you sustain, you, 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 uh, you, uh, you till and like stuff out. So you have to really figure out what you're trying to sustain. Um, here in the United States, uh, I'm the chair of the North American Climate Smart Agriculture, or NAXA, 
and we work a lot with Canada. Canada has been a very, very big player. They're very much like uh, we are. We work with their Fertilizer Institute as well as ours here in the United States. Uh, somewhat to a less degree is, is Mexico, but we still have some Mexico representation. So what we're, all, we're all trying to get on the same page and have, have a unified message so we can go, and we want to be the template for agriculture in the, in the, in the globe, uh, and that's why we're working so hard to do that. Um, but we're also trying, we also realized as we went through this whole process that everything has to start local. You know, we can have all these tools in the toolbox, but, but what works mainly for me in, say, central Ohio may not work in northwest Ohio, you know, because of the, the soil types, the, the landscape, the watershed. So everything has to start local. But that's what we have to do. We, we, we have to do is find lots of tools to put in the toolbox and then be able to apply them wherever they may, may be necessary because every watershed has different components as well, you know, whether it's volume of water, whether it's uh, shape, uh, <clears throat> again, soil types. So we, we have to figure out a way to, to do the work and, and make sure that, that everyone can, can have the same outcome, but they might have a different way of getting to that outcome. So we, we have, uh, we just comp completed a, a program called Ohio Smart Ag Solutions from the Land. And uh, if you ever want to see that, if you don't have, have not seen a copy, you can always go to sfldialogue.net. And uh, there's, there's uh, it's a pretty good, I'm pretty proud of that, uh, that uh, uh, white paper because it, it it's really talks about not only uh, production methodology, but also uh, food security. And so we, my co-chair was, Lisa Hamler Fugit, which is the head of all the uh, the food um, banks in Ohio, and so uh, I learned a lot. And, and then there were assumptions made of, of those people, other people that were not farmers, that, and they learned a lot. So that's really what we have to do is is find a unified message and, and work together, because when you we have a group of the pe people that can, you can trust, you can move things forward. What's that website again? S, it's sfldialogue.net. So when it comes right down to it, when we start thinking about the future, you know, growing up, we didn't think about this stuff. All we worried about was getting our crops planted, getting them, uh, you know, nursing them through the growing season, then harvesting and taking them down to the co-op. And that was the end of it. Well, now there's a new emphasis on, on agriculture and how our food is raised. And there's lots of people that think they know about agriculture, but really don't. So it's really up to us. So we have to have Farmers like you step up and, 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 and take the, the message to the people that really need it. So, so we really have to think about what is the, the game plan for tomorrow. So by 2030, America's farms, ranches, forests are in the forefront of resolving food system, energy, environmental, and climate challenges, and achieving global sustainable goals. Agriculture is defined by solutions and not problems. So what we have to do is, is take ownership of this because I'll guarantee you, and then we've also seen this in, all, in Northwest Ohio with the water quality, if we keep getting defensive and stand back and resist everything, we're gonna be regulated. So we gotta figure this out ahead of time. We gotta figure out how we're gonna do this and how we're going to be a part of the solution. And that's why uh, the farmers are so involved in the H2 Ohio. So our business model uh, amounts to uh, we need farmers. We are farmer-led and farmer-based, and, and who better to tell the rest of the world what will work and what will not work on a farm? Because we know, and we, we you know, we all know what, what's feasible to try, and we all know what's not going to be feasible to try because we probably already tried it ahead of time. Less government-centric. Uh, a lot of times, we know what happens in Washington. Uh, policy is is important, but it needs to be enabling policy for us to try some some things that we, you know, we want to do. I personally would love to see some safe harbor provisions in the farm bill that we can try some different things that are not necessarily uh, in, the, in the law right now, but still able to, to try without getting uh, hung out to dry on, on maybe some compliance issues and, or maybe losing out on some payments or whatever. Multi-stakeholder partnerships. We're working with people that we normally would not work with. We work with a lot of green groups. There's a couple of green groups that are willing to work with farmers, such as Environmental Defense Fund, uh, the Nature Conservancy, um, American Farmland Trust, people like that. That uh, you know, they, And once they understand, and, and we've been very helpful to them, understanding what, what we can do on the farm and, and what we're willing to do, but we're going to have to spread that. This, the other thing is, is academia and, and extension, those type of people. We're all in this together, 
And so we have to have a unified voice to work together and, and, and speak with, with, with the same language. Uh, landscape scale planning and the implementation, that, like I said, it has to start in your own landscape, your own watershed, because your watershed may be unique to some others that are around in the same state even. Incentive-driven reward system for ecosystem services. Now, I personally haven't taken a dime of money from any kind of government program to, when I started no-till, and I personally did it just for, to save money. I thought, I'm not making any money farming. I've got to find ways that I can cut costs. So I, I turned to no-till. And then uh, I got pretty good at it. And, and then we incorporated uh, uh, some cover crops about five or six years ago. And now we would put cover crops on everything. And it's not, it's not all the panacea that, that, that's happening out there. We had to learn. Cover crops have to be managed. You have to use, learn, learn how to use them. And you got to, uh, once, once you do get comfortable with them, you have to also explore ways to, uh, to uh, figure out what, how cover crops can even uh, do more for you. And that's where uh, people like Dave Brandt is, is experimenting with different mixes, different, different uh, types of, of cover crops you mix together to do certain things. So uh, we got a lot to learn, but we've come a long way in a very short time. And the other thing too is, uh, is people look at, uh, at agriculture as the, the corporate of everything bad. Like, you know, the, the world is, is contributing about 30% in agriculture, 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture worldwide. The United States is only contributing about, it was less than 10%, about 9%. So we're already way ahead in the rest of the world. So I think we should be able to take our model and, and, and use it for others. But uh, one of the reasons, that, uh, I, again, I did, I did my change and I'm, I did a, um, our farm did a, 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 an economic study with uh, Environmental Defense Fund a couple years ago. You might have read about it, and well, I think it's Progressive Farmer, I'm not sure. Anyway, my son Josh is the one that looked at all the data. There was four, four family farms that were working on it just to basically see, do cover crops really pay for themselves? And one of the things that, that I, I really wanted to know whether we did it because we wanted to do it to build our soil, but we actually showed uh, through our, our, our data that uh, it, it went anywhere from breaking even to uh, I think a two or three bushel increase on soybeans versus no cover crop and the corn is up to eight bushel uh, increase in corn. So at least it, it broke even and then some. So you gotta look at your soil like your 401k. You're not gonna get instant gratification like a banker wants to see you do, uh, but it's important that you do it uh, because those, the next generation is gonna have a much better chance of being uh, successful uh, with, with healthier soil than they would without it. So this is a little bit of a current state versus future state. It gets kind of muddled, but anyway, this is what we have to do to, to work on the future. You know, we have to create, uh, recruit uh, other conveners that, that, we're, that, will, that are willing to work with us and, and understand what we are trying to accomplish. We got to engage the core farmer uh, members and our partners to work together, uh, discuss things, uh, identify pathways to a future vision, and develop an action plan and then go ahead and test it out. And then we get to a future state where we're sustainable and resilient. And uh, that's, that's where we're gonna be, uh, have to be so we can manage our, our future without having us uh, being regulated by, by somebody else that doesn't understand farming. This is the holy grail when it comes to everyone understanding uh, what we need to do in the future. And that's the three pillars of climate smart agriculture. This resonates with farmers throughout the, the, the nation. And one of the reasons that it resonates is because it starts with the three pillars and it's important that we understand the, the, the significance of, of the order. The first pillar is productivity. Every farmer is looking for ways to, to be sustainable and make money. Profit is not a dirty word. We have to get paid for, we have to have enough money to pay for all the expense and leave something left to live on. But that's where it has to start. We, we use this, this name called sustainable intensification. And I've had people tell me that's a, that's a conflict of, um, it's, it's an oxymoron. No, it's not, we can do that. We're gonna have to feed, you know, nearly two, uh, what, nine, nine million, or 10 million people, billion people, excuse me, by 2050. And we're gonna have to almost double our, our food uh, production by then. But we're gonna have to do it on less acres because every, every day we see acres go out and go to, uh, to uh, some development and things like that. So that's pillar one. And then pillar two is adaptation and resiliency. <clears throat> and that, that's where soil health comes in. You know, it's, it's really, it warms my heart that a lot of the, uh, 
the farm magazines are really pushing uh, soil health. They've got the soil health partnership that a lot of farmers are involved with. <clears throat> and, and so we also know that the, the healthier your soil is, um, the, that mitigates risk. You know, for every 1% organic matter that you can gain in your field, you can hold an extra 25,000 gallon of water. That works on a dry year, but boy, it sure works on a wet year too, so that, that water doesn't run off. So uh, soil health, you know, and, 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 and sequestering that carbon to make your soils more healthy is really part of the, the, the second one, and adaptation. A lot of folks, you know, you, you think, well, you know, we've unfortunately turned climate change into a very political thing. You know, I've talked to farmers and asked them if they believe in climate change, and they say, absolutely not. It's, it's, a, it's a hoax. But then you say, has your weather patterns changed? Absolutely, they're nothing like they used to be. So it's a matter of terms. I, I wish we could just quit be, being, you know, leave it out of the politics. The climate's always changed. You know, when I grew up, you know, we, we planted corn and soybeans for two months, anywhere from the first of May to the end of June. We had, we had two months to plant. Today, if you don't plant your crops, you know, in 10 days to two weeks, you've missed the window. It's a very short window. Now, have we adapted? We sure have. How many farmers in here have the same size planter they had the data 20 years ago? No. We all got bigger planters. We can all do more things. You can do faster things with no-till. I mean, no-till is a very efficient way to do things. So, so we've been adapting whether we admit it or not because of our own situation at home and our, and our own uh, uh, farm. So, so uh, let's forget the politics of it and let's just, how do we adapt to a changing weather pattern? If, call it that if you want to. We all have. You know, it's a difference. There's a difference between taking a two inch rain and a four inch rain. And one of the problems I think we've had in, in Northwest Ohio is you know, with, the, with the Maumee River watershed is, is you take a, a two inch rain and you know, most of that can be, so, be uh, soaked in the ground. But when you've got a four or five inch rain in, you know, in an hour, you're gonna have surface runoff. And that's, so it's no fault of the farmer really to, spe to, to speak from what he's been doing before. We're not using any more fertilizer to speak of but we're, the weather's have changed where, where the, some of that water's running off. So how do we, how do we figure out how to keep those, those nutrients uh, in place? You know, and cover crops are a good way, but there's also some other soil amendments like uh, gypsum and things like that that we gotta use, a bioreactor by your, your filter. There's lots of different things we can do, and it, it depends on where you're at. So that's what adaptation and resiliency is all about. Then the third pillar is, is reduction of greenhouse gas. But if you do number one and number two, number three happens anyway. You don't have to worry about it. The problem we have today is everyone, especially your uh, big corporations, they want to start with pillar three. We got to, you know, we got to be uh, carbon neutral by in ten years, or we got to do. I work with the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. They want us to all commit to the 1.5 challenge. Uh, that's a one and a half degree Celsius. Um, raise in the temperature by, by 2050 or 2030. And, and that's, it, again, it's putting the cart before the horse. We have to do number one and number two, and number three will happen, and that's, that's the way you're going to get a farmer to change this way. That's going to work a lot better than if you have a new regulation come out and say, you will do this, you will do that, you know, and, and farmers actually, are, off the record, are very good at figuring out ways around regulations. So. If you really want to move the, the needle, that's the way you have to do it. So this is a very important uh, a slide. This is how we're going to get farmers involved. That's all I have. I, I could say a lot more, but I'd like to open up for questions. I, I'm sure you have some questions. I, 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 I see a lot of things. I see a lot of uh, folks that are frustrated by things, but I also have great hope and, and that we have uh, ways to solve these problems. But uh, what are your questions? No questions? Yeah. What's some of your most frustrating dialogue that you have? The most frustrating, one of the most frustrating things is when I was in uh, Madrid here last December, and they were going around, all the nations were going around, and there was a fellow there from, who was one of the African countries, and he was saying we have to, he was all about subsistent farming. We all need to get smaller. We need to go, everyone needs to just farm more, no more than two hectares or 10 acres. And, and that we need to cut out all um, synthetic fertilizers. Because when you use synthetic fertilizers, the more you use, the more organic matter you burn from your, your soil. That is absolutely unscientific, and, and, but yet you're sitting there, you can't say anything. There's another one that was talking about uh, 
um, we have to get rid of bovines or, or, or cattle that they uh, that they will because of all their their the ways they pass gas at each end that, that they're a big problem we could we could cut our emissions by by 10 percent it would just eliminate all cattle well there's a problem with that too because you know what about all the non-cropland use that that cattle use with grazing I mean, this is grass fed and and yet then they and they they do you know intense rotational grazing they stomp their manure in the ground and, and they sequester uh, carbon just like just like we do in raised corn or soybeans but but it's it's those un, the, the 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 frustration for me is they're not science based they're not uh, they're no way that they they're using facts i mean you know science isn't perfect but it's the best tool we have so let's use science as we move down this we have a good story to tell we really do and farmers can can sequester carbon i know we'll argue about the cost of carbon you know like we heard just a few minutes ago but but I really do believe that someday we'll be recognized for the ecosystem services that we can provide to the to the consumer, and maybe they need the cost share. I mean, if we're after, if the if the goal is to get rid of uh, of carbon dioxide uh, because you know our concentration is over 400 parts per per billion or whatever, uh, that we have a, we have a good story to tell. And but the the frustration for me is the the assumptions people make that we're doing on the farm that they have no idea. Yes. That's a good question. The question was, uh, what about, uh, you know, we got a lot of hungry people, and, and are we, do, are, we do, are we, are we addressing the food waste? Because some people say we, we waste between 35 and 40 percent of the food that we actually uh, produce. And it's a little bit stoner. One of the good things about producing commodities like corn, soybeans, wheat, is that can be stored and that can be, uh, you know, used at a later time. But fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, one of the biggest problems we have with that is logistics, getting them out. And, and you, you talk to your local grocery store, and they, they, they throw away an awful lot of fruits and vegetables. Um, and, and it is true. We do waste a lot. we got to do a better job on logistics. But the other problem, too, is, is uh, we don't have a shortage of those things. It's just we have a problem people can afford and, and get to the right place. I know uh, I learned a lot about food distribution from my co-chair, uh, Lisa. Uh, and she said an awful lot of the fresh fruits, fruits and vegetables will go in the stores and go to the food banks, but then you have a very short window. And a lot of times, uh, they're not allowed to give away stuff that's dated. You know, like it says sell by such and such. That doesn't mean it's bad. It just says sell by. And if it's a day after the sell by, they got to throw it away. So we got to do a better job on that. The other problem is, is, is we have an awful lot of misshaped. People go. To, I mean, I, let's be honest. We go to the store and we buy by by sight. If things look nice, we buy it. How many times do you reach back in the the back to find a, a, a bit nicer looking one? We buy by looks. And unfortunately, uh, there's an awful lot of fruits and vegetables that are thrown away because it's an odd shape. So how do we do with way with that? We got to figure out ways that. But but waste is a big thing. And a lot of your people that are anti. Uh, Technology like, like anti-GMO, that's what they're saying. We don't have a food shortage, we have a distribution shortage. So that's one of the things we have to address, we do. Any more? One. So the topic was uh, no-till climate change. I was hoping to hear facts and figures how no use of no-till cover crops is uh, going to lower the number of lower Do we answer that or you want to? Well, it's absolutely, the, the, the thing that we're working on now, a lot of people are working on the metrics of how do you measure. You know the old, the old saying, you, can't me you measure to manage. You can't, ma you can't manage it if you don't, can't measure it. So one of the things that, that we're doing now is there's a lot of groups, and this group is getting very, very, uh, very large with people trying to figure out how to put a price on carbon. And you know the the low hanging fruit is agriculture because we can we can we can sequester anywhere from one ton to four tons per acre per year. And one of the problems you, when you get down in the weeds of, of how do you how do you recognize what a farmer could possibly be rewarded for is 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 the permanence. Is that permanent? Is that carbon going to stay in the in the the ground permanently if you turn around and, and till like two years later? And 
should you have to pay that money back if you got paid, you know, say you got paid for, for that carbon sequestration. So that the, all of those things are being worked out, but we're on the way. We're going to, agriculture will be the one to, we have the, we have the, the capability, I'm not going to say we can do it, we have the capability of being actually carbon negative in 10 years. There's a, there's a, there's a uh, challenge out there by, uh, um, I think it's, it's with the uh, U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance that they think we can be carbon negative in 10 years. Uh, but the problem is you can't start with that pillar three. You've got to start with pillar one. Farmers have to make money. And so if, if you restrict it, if you figure out, you know, uh, my, my good friend A.G. Carmar from California always says farmers are notorious for negotiating to lose less. Well, we don't want to do that. We've got to figure out a way to make money at this. And, and that's what we're going to do. So those metrics have to be figured out, and I'll guarantee you, somebody will figure. You got people. Beware of some some of these big corporations coming around and saying, "I'm here to help," and you know, sign the contract here. There's, I'm not, I'm not going to mention the names, but I know two two or three outfits that come out and they want you to sign up with them and and create these carbon credits, and you're going to get paid pittance. Believe me, you're going to get paid pittance. So let's let's be patient. Let's figure out the, the way that we can make substantial. Uh, ecosystem service payments. And, and then we also have to have, uh, I'm involved in some outfits in, in D.C., I'm going there tomorrow, to talk about how do we have enabling policy? How can we get the government to, uh, to allow us to do some things? Like, for instance, there was a couple of years ago that if you had federal crop insurance and you grew uh, cover crop, you, you, you were at risk for losing your, your uh, crop insurance payment. Well, we had to fix that, but that was one issue. Because we have to have a much broader uh, portrait of, of, of things we can do. We're, we're on the cusp of this. It's going to, it, the, but it comes down to these metrics have to be decided on science too. And, and again, uh, there's a lot of different things about permanence and also uh, uh, there's an awful lot of people that are saying, well, if you've already been doing this for all these years, why should we pay you an extra payment if, if you're not? Because I say every single crop you raise, you're sequestering carbon. It's not like you've, you know, uh, it be called additionality. Well, it's additional every time you grow a crop. You should be rewarded for that. So, keep keep your mind, keep your eyes, ear, ears peeled on on ecosystem services. You're going to see a lot about that, and they're going to figure out a way. If they, we truly want to get the 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 air content lowered in CO2, then farmers are the easiest way to do it. People like facts and figures, and it's one thing to stay up there, stand up there, and say that you're working towards sustainability. And that. It seems to me if you got some economists and some mathematicians as part of your groups and your your pro agriculture organizations and you put together some of these numbers about uh, less solar radiation, uh, less fuel consumption, and so we don't need as much fertilizer, you know, take all the positive things and put numbers to it so you can say, look, we reduced this much, you know, we're saving here, we're saving here, you know, lay it out. The unknowing person doesn't know anything about agriculture. They just follow this. It's pretty impressive. That's, that's who we are. In fact, I would invite you again. Go to sfldialogue.net and we, you'll see the Ohio Smart Ag, the whole, uh, and, and 50 new, new recommendations. And it does have some facts and figures and not about what we can do. But it also talks about food security and health and things like that. It's a system we've got to change. Not just a one, one thing here and one thing there. It's a system. So. That's exactly who we are. We we love you to help. Yeah. The main, the main problem we got, Fred, is that the public doesn't understand that we get one shot a year to make something right, where the other people can change tomorrow what they said today. But for our records and things to come up with the carbon, get them to understand that we can't do it overnight. Like they think it, everybody's so instantaneous now, but they need to understand we've got to go through a crop season. Result. Not only we have to go through a crop season, but we have to put up with the weather. Correct. Last year is a perfect example. 2019, we planted all of our crops in, in, in June. I've never done that before. And you know what? We had a half decent crop. We, I mean, it was corn was down about 15 percent, soybeans were down about 20 percent, but it was, it was it was it was decent, you know, and it was pretty good quality. Now we had some neighbors that were conventional that didn't do no-till no or cover crops. They started when I, I, I was done, and 80% of what they did with the rest of it was they applied for preventive planting. So 
this is this is this is about mitigating risk, and most people don't understand how in the world you get by with with the changing weather patterns and how do we do that? We do that in spite of ourselves. I got friends in in uh, in, in California that, that he says I don't know how you guys do it. I want to turn my water on and turn it off, and that's how I that's how I'm sustainable. We don't have that luxury. I think I'm out of time. Thank you. Well, okay. oh, no one wrap, more. Let me wrap up with one. Okay. <laughs> what? what? Your, your top key figure uh, about uh, ignorance, what's the oh. biggest item up there, maybe in one minute? The, the biggest thing about ignorance is people have assumptions of how we produce. You know, uh, I still have people asking me, have you got your plowing done? I haven't owned a plow. I haven't had a plow for, for 20 years. I mean, I, you don't plow. And now, granted, when I was growing up, we'd plow day and night, you know, make sure we got all good un, un, turned under. They don't understand, again, the weather issues, the, the, the different challenges we've had, but they also don't understand that, that we do things for a certain reason. I mean, it's not just willy-nilly. Now, now we, are, we are still all guilty of some folks saying, well, I do it because we've always done it that way. I think we need to take a, a new, fresh approach, but the ignorance comes from when we, like the whole thing about the Northwest Ohio, that we're purposely slathering on phosphorus, and we just need to stop putting so much phosphorus on, and that's not, it's not true at all. So, you know, we, we had less acres planted in corn and soybeans in Northwest Ohio last year. We still had algae blooms. Why is that? Because it was, it was, it was a long time coming. So the people need to understand and not what's going on in agriculture, and they don't. So that's why we all have to spread the word.